It's a little too quiet out there. Can we please raise up the volume a little bit out there? This is DEF CON. Y'all acting like there's a pandemic out there or something. All right, we're going to kick off this uh, early evening party panel talk here uh, about the most happy topic on the planet, which is what the dumpster fire is going on with healthcare, right? But before we begin with that, I just wanted to say we all really appreciate you coming out here. I'm going to introduce myself quickly, then Replicant at the end is going to talk a little bit. We'll get to introducing the rest of our panel, which is who, who you truly came here for. Please give it up in the middle here. And then we're going to get to some topics. We'll talk a little bit about the format. Cool. All right. Uh, my name's Kwadi. Welcome to the Do No Harm panel. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit as an introduction about this because this is not the first time we've done this and perhaps of all the other times we've had this panel, this year may be the most important. And so what the hell are we talking about up here? And it's uh, the fact that we're all going to die and somewhere between now and when you die, you're going to probably interact with a hospital. You're going to talk with doctors and nurses. You're going to have medicines and whatnot. And believe it or not, it uh, ends up that healthcare nowadays is pretty damn connected and it's all running vulnerable shit. And for the most part, uh, it's been a raging dumpster fire for us as long as I've been around pretty much. That is what this is about. If you're interested about learning other stuff, there's another really awesome talk going on, but we'd encourage you here. Uh, and then also we'll have some opportunity to answer questions. Jeff, go ahead and take it. Sure. So for those who may not have come to one of these before, this is actually the fifth year that we've been doing this. And I just want to give a quick shout out because this entire idea started as a conversation between inebriated people in the hotel room of a one Mr. Bo Woods who is sitting here in the middle with us. And those of us who are adjacent to or exploring this space were like, hey, it's all, uh, we're all here at DEF CON. Let's actually sit down and see if we can figure some of this stuff out ourselves. So that has morphed into something that we have been honored and privileged to be able to do at DEF CON now for the last couple of years. And what we really wanted to try to do with each and every iteration, but especially now, is give you guys the chance to have conversations with people who are superstars in the fields that we're talking about here. Ask your questions, figure out how you can get involved and really face to face with some pretty incredible people. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a little bit of a conversation between us, probably aim for about 45 to 60 minutes on that, and then we'd like to open it up for general questions from the audience, but then at some point we're all just going to kind of split off and move to different parts of the room and would love to pick your brains, uh, hear from you, and sort of talk about some of these issues in a little bit more uh, personal space. Um, before we introduce our panel, the last thing that I do want to say is that we had two folks uh, that are affiliated with the federal government who were unable to make it uh, here in person because of travel restrictions. Anybody really interested in hearing from two incredible people uh, should check out our recorded talk, but it's basically Josh Corman from CISA and Jessica Wilkerson from the FDA. And so we wish they were here. I think we're going to hear from Josh a little bit later, but that's the one caveat. Um, starting down with Quadi. Um, give a little bit more information about who you are, what you're up to, and then we'll go through our panel and introduce ourselves. Hey, I'm Quadi. Um, I am actually an ER doc, so if you meet me at work, you're having the worst day of your life. I hope not to meet you in the emergency department, uh, but maybe somewhere else like at a bar. And when I'm not doing work in the emergency department, I um, do cybersecurity research on medical devices, uh, healthcare impacts of um, cyber attacks, basically like ransomware. How does ransomware harm patients? Uh, and then again, sorry, right before we get to Bo, who's the next one, we wanted to also say a giant shout out to DEF CON. Fifth year this has been here. We really appreciate this. You guys being out here got a hell of a thing to put together. Thank you, DEF CON, from all of us that do no harm. All right, go ahead and introduce yourself, Bo. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Bo Woods. Um, I, I do a lot of different things. Um, I actually started my career in healthcare. I worked at a hospital for about three years. Uh, in, in IT and in InfoSec. And uh, one of the, I don't know, interesting characteristics that I found is like uh, a, a lot of healthcare networks are a little bit like um, archaeology. You find all kinds of uh, things that you thought were dead living in hospitals on the networks where they probably really shouldn't be. Um, more recently, 
Uh, I've been a part of an initiative called I Am The Cavalry, which is a global grassroots initiative. A uh, bunch of hackers got together and said, you know, our dependence on connected technology is growing faster than our ability to secure it in areas impacting human life, public safety. Um, and no matter how high and deep we got into federal government and industry, we found that the, the cavalry wasn't coming. We realized we were the adults in the room and that scared the hell out of you, as it should scare anyone to have some dude with a random blue mohawk uh, who, uh, who is, you know, the adult in the room. Um, but we have managed to turn that into some really good impact, including, um, you know, I worked at the FDA for a year on building a new pathway to market for software as a medical device. So like the app on your watch that tells you if you're having atrial fibrillation. Um, also uh, drafted up something called the Hippocratic Oath for Connected Medical Devices, which we may talk a little bit about uh, in a bit. Um, and has led me to do a lot more with, with healthcare uh, and industry, including uh, starting the device lab at the Biohacking Village, which if you haven't gone and checked that out yet this year, you really should. It's, it's a ton of fun, um, and they're doing some really good things over there. So I could probably talk all night, but I won't. All right, my name is Gabrielle. Um, I started kind of like Bo, my career in science and healthcare. Started out doing pharmaceutical and medical device regulation. Moved into cybersecurity kind of through all of that. And now I currently work as a cloud security engineer in healthcare and also do medical device research and genetic science consulting on the side. Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie and I started out in the offensive security research space focused predominantly on embedded systems and then about seven years ago I decided there was this really big need in the healthcare space for security savvy people to kind of come in and, and help, right, elevate the maturity. And so I've spent the last seven years as a consultant in the security for medical device space. So I've worked with medical device manufacturers on just about every stage of securing medical devices. Um, also with hospitals and healthcare delivery organizations on how do they manage the risk of the medical devices that they have. And then even regulators to help them understand what should they be looking at from a cybersecurity perspective before they clear a device for sale, um, both here in the United States and abroad. And my name is Replicant. I am an amateur computer hacker and a professional central nervous system hacker. So as an anesthesiologist, I toss your brain uh, while people poke you with sharp objects. And I work with Quadi um, on the academic side of things to take a look at medical device security, infrastructure security, and how that's a patient safety outcomes based issue. Um, so let's just give a big round of applause for everybody other than me. What a great panel. And this is usually a little bit more of an intimate affair in a much smaller room, so it's really cool to see everybody out here. Um, at, at, the liber at, at the risk of um, perhaps boring some people who are very familiar with this concept, I wanted to take the liberty of asking some of our panelists to sort of give a very general 30,000 foot view sketch of some of the topics we're talking about, just in case you wandered in here because there's nothing else to do and you are hearing about this type of um, security for the first time. So Stephanie, we're going to ask you to give a little bit of an overview about what's been going on with medical devices and then Bo to talk a little bit about the infrastructure and policy issues. Yeah, so I'll actually take just 10 seconds to explain to everyone just what actually is a medical device. So it's a term that gets thrown around a lot, but it actually has a legal meaning. And so I'm not going to get too boring, but just understand that anything, anything in the healthcare space that helps treat or diagnose a medical condition is considered a medical device. So something like a tongue depressor, that big popsicle stick that they put in your mouth, that is actually a medical device. Um, and so it ranges from the non-digital all the way through the digital that you're probably thinking of with things like pacemakers and insulin pumps. And so understanding all of those are regulated as medical devices, but the, the potential for patient harm that that device can cause um, against a patient is what dictates basically what severity of a medical device it is or what class it is. So not all medical devices are treated equally. A class three medical device like a pacemaker is held to a much higher bar from a regulatory perspective. Um, and so understand when we talk about cybersecurity for medical devices, um, that bar, it's, it's all risk management based game, right? There's no compliance, there's no certification in medical device cybersecurity. It's all risk management based. It is you putting together the story as a manufacturer of here's what I did for cybersecurity, here's how I perceive the risk in my medical device, and then taking that to a regulator and saying, 
here, I think I've controlled enough of the risks in this device that you should let me sell it here um, in this country. And so this journey really started back in 2014. So the first um, regulatory guidance around cybersecurity for medical devices came out from the FDA in 2014. And it was around what we call pre-market cybersecurity. So all the things you needed to do for cybersecurity as a medical device manufacturer to get your device ready to sell. Um, the post-market cybersecurity guidance came out a few years after that, and then that overviewed everything you needed to do after that medical device was approved for sale here in the United States than what you needed to do for that. Um, the FDA has gone back, and they're working on a revision for that pre-market guidance, um, but it's currently out in draft form. So if you want to see sort of where is the FDA going with the requirements that they're, they're now putting in medical devices, you can read um, the current draft version of the pre-market guidance that's out. Um, and the FDA has been a really, they've been awesome in this space. They have absolutely been partnering with the security research community, the medical device manufacturers, and they're trying to really grow, grow cybersecurity and medical devices without stifling innovation. It's a really, really tough balancing act to make sure that we continue to raise that bar in cybersecurity, but you can't stop innovation in medical devices. Um, and so that delicate balance, and sorry, I won't pontificate forever. <laughs> No, that was awesome. And then, of course, we've just had a smattering in the last like 15 years of uh, vulnerable medical devices that caught some attention, right? So uh, we had the pacemaker AICDs devices implanted inside your body that can shock your heart when the, your heart rhythm starts getting strange, right? Those have been vulnerable and demonstrated to be potentially deadly if attacked. Uh, infusion pumps that control the rate of medication going into patients, those are also been shown to be vulnerable like in 2015. And insulin pumps, I mean, there's a whole host of devices and it seems like the common thread was I, a researcher wanted to learn more about it, they bought a device off of eBay or got it somewhere else and in a short time they found that something really potentially concerning about patient safety. Awesome. So uh, we're going to go now. It's not just about medical devices. We're going to talk today also about like hospital infrastructure. One of the concepts we're going to talk about is, is you know, how can uh, vulnerability, if exploited, impact a person's life, right? Their ability to be diagnosed with a particular disease or get the treatment that they need. And all that stuff that supports that care is all that infrastructure. And so Bo's going to talk a little bit about just an introduction to healthcare. Uh, infrastructure and its vulnerabilities as well. I'm curious. I know every time we do this, um, after we after we step down from the the podium uh, and go out in the crowd, always there's like five or six people who come up to me like, "Man, I work in a hospital. That was so cool." Um, you're talking about the things that I live and breathe every day. So just by show of hands, if you want to raise your hand, who works in or has worked in a hospital dealing with tech stuff? Okay, that's a good number. Um, how many have had loved ones in the hospital or have been in a context in a setting where you were impacted uh, by ransomware or some other type of security incident at a hospital? Raise your hand. Okay, a few people. Um, one of my first days working security at a hospital uh, we had a network worm that went around and it hit a bunch of servers. Um, didn't, didn't think too much of it. You know, we were able to pop in with a remote desktop or whatever, push uh, some, some policies out to get rid of it. Uh, it wasn't too big of a deal for too long. It probably took us you know, half a day to clean up, which is not terrible. Um, the next day I went in and I got a call from uh, a physician in the natal intensive care unit. And the natal intensive care unit, if you don't know, it's where some of the most vulnerable patients in a hospital are. It's you know, premature babies and, uh, and the patients who they struggle just to take their first breath. Um, and they're a little bit behind the curve to start with. And the physician who called me up was like, hey, uh, you know, our, uh, our fetal heart monitors are going up and down and every time they, uh, every time they go offline and come back on, they have this window screen uh, and it's happening about every 15 minutes or so. I wonder, you know, I know you're not the medical device person, but can you help us out with this? I said, hey, sure, I'll give it a shot, right? So I knew that we had the network worm the day before, Windows screen, so I started going through a, a quick diagnostic, and it turns out that these fetal heart monitors, which are um, systems that uh, basically track 
the premature baby's uh, biorhythm so that uh, the nurses can sit and watch it so that it can feed into the medical care that the, the doctors give. Um, they were infected with this banking trojan that was meant to steal grandma's, you know, uh, bank password. But instead, it was causing in these devices a reboot every 15 minutes. And so it would lose patient state. And what happens in that case is uh, you have to have a lot more patient care delivered manually by doctors and nurses who are really competent, but it takes a toll. So you need extra uh, doctors and nurses coming in. Um, the consistency will dip if it's not automated because humans are, are more fallible than uh, computer programs. And so basically these, uh, these vulnerable patients were at a loss. So I uh, called up the manufacturer. The manufacturer said, oh, you know, sorry, that sounds like a, a malicious software issue. We don't cover that. Um, said, OK, well, give me the password. I can get into it. I know how to get rid of this. It's not a problem. They're like, oh, we can't give you the password. It's a medical device. You can change something. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> so there's a virus. There's unwanted, known malicious code on this. And I want to put known productive code, you know, the, the patch that the manufacturer issued and the uh, software manufacturer for the operating system. And you won't let me do that because that's a change, but malicious software is not a big enough change for you to, you know, have a problem with it. They're like, well, you know, that's whatever. Um, they used a line, which is a lie, that it's a medical device and therefore we can't change it without getting reauthorized by the FDA. Totally not true. Um, and we can talk about that more probably in, in some of the after chat. Uh, so I reasoned that if this device got hit by um, a piece of malware, a network worm, the vulnerability exists. I can exploit that vulnerability too. So I drafted a, a justification, went up to hospital leadership, got all the necessary approvals. They thought it through. Um, and started just using Metasploit to pop the boxes, drop the patch, kill the malware, and get the doctors back to saving lives. <laughs> Yay, Metasploit. Hacking for good, right? I mean, we want to use our hacking skills for something good, and this was a really productive use. I, I was able to, to put the doctors back in charge of patient care rather than uh, being dominated by uh, malicious actors who ended up being um, in, I think, Morocco and, and uh, Turkey at the time. Um, so that uh, was like my first introduction to security and my first introduction to healthcare security. And it's gotten a lot better since then, fortunately. But that's the type of consequences that you have in healthcare that you don't have in a lot of other industries, right? So I worked a lot in banking and retail and other places. Um, a bank system gets hacked and probably not too many people are gonna die from that. Um, a hospital systems go down, and the consequences are much different. They're materially different, not just in, uh, in degree, but in kind. Um, in addition to that, uh, you know, you have medical record systems, which, you know, we probably have all been to a hospital or at least a doctor's office and had our patient records uh, go into this computing system, which allows doctors to track us it allows us to do a lot more positive things with population health so that we can find causes of diseases, so that we can track people uh, through their medical records and be able to treat them if they go from you know, Dr. A in Sacramento to Dr. B in New York City. Um, so there's a lot of benefits, but yet these electronic health systems, um, in some cases, were prematurely connected. We incentivized putting these health records in a computerized system uh, but we didn't necessarily incentivize to the same degree securing those systems. In hindsight, a lot of us in this room look back at it as a mistake, and yet there's also scientifically rigorous data that shows that that has helped uh, population health improve. Um, in my uh, more recent life in, in doing cyber policy, and I feel like I can say cyber in this crowd, uh, because I live inside the Beltway, I live in DC, and I work in uh, talking to, to policymakers, uh, so I, I promise I will drink later for saying that. Um, but uh, in, um, in thinking about some of these issues, um, oh man, I lost my thread. Talking about uh, 
the cybers and drinking. Too much drinking already, Bo. Too much drinking already, possibly. Well, you know, I, I am compliant with the three, two, one rule. I got four hours of sleep each of the last five or six nights, so I am ready to go. Um, although I missed my second meal yesterday, and I need to get a second meal today, otherwise I'm gonna be all out of compliance. Um, but uh, in my, my role as cyber policy person, uh, I've talked to a lot of people in, in high positions of, of power, and one of those was uh, a former president of a European nation. And after having some of these conversations where uh, before the conversation was all about um, data confidentiality, we started talking about health records. And so the, the very shorthand version that he came up with was, I don't care as much if somebody can read my blood type, I care if they can change it in the system. That would cause a much bigger impact. And while we've spent over the past five years uh, about a trillion dollars globally on, on people, product, services, most of that has been focused on data confidentiality. And the capabilities that you use for data confidentiality are very different than the ones that you would use to protect the integrity and availability of human life. So I think hospitals and other uh, uh, other places where you deliver healthcare are really interesting places where um, we may not have the, the hands-on experience to deal with those types of infrastructure um, in the same way that they need to be handled. So less of a data-focused aspect and more of a, uh, an impact of physical conditions. Um, and so uh, the, the infrastructure in hospitals is very different than what we may think of. And so when we apply some of our general rules, we might have to think differently a little bit uh, to make sure that we don't inadvertently um, cause harm to, uh, to human life. Uh, Christian, you've got a great line. I may butcher it, but uh, it's something like, as we seek to treat existing pathologies, we should be careful not to inadvertently create new ones. That sounds much smarter than I actually am. Yeah, he read that on a fortune cookie. <laughs> yeah, Vicky. so I'll, I'll take that one. <laughs> All right, so, Jeff. so yeah. So I want to I want to ask the panel a question, and I want to start with Gab first. Uh, but basically, like we have these types of conversations every year, and one of the most interesting things is what what is the change in our thinking from year to year? And obviously, we are 18 months now into a global pandemic, which is a sentence I ever thought I'd say in med school. Um, but Gab, like you have a, a very unique and interesting role as part of our response. So what what have you learned in the past? 12 to 18 months that has really sort of changed your preconceived notions about what we need to be thinking about when we talk about the security in, in, in healthcare? I think we've seen a really big stress on our health system and we've seen a lot of hospitals at or beyond their capacity and it's made people realize that yes, we need to figure out what's going on, uh, what we can do to kind of keep this from happening again. and. I think we've also seen situations where that max capacity that the hospitals did reach was exploited in some ways. Um, if a hospital is at max capacity and suddenly they are hit by ransomware, malware, taken down, um, that's, that's a huge problem. That's so many patients that have issues. And I know there's been quite a few breaches in the last year. Um, it seems like healthcare breaches have been in the news a lot more than maybe previous years because of the fact that COVID has everything in the spotlight. But um, I mean, there have been times that, you know, the cardiac cath lab went down. They couldn't use any of the materials, um, machines that they needed to in those labs or, you know, um, use the ICU as intended. And um, it's just become a lot more of a visible issue, I think. Yeah, and so I'll add on to that, you know, one of the things um, in working with hospitals at the beginning of the pandemic or before it, it happened, you know, there was this really growing maturity and how are we handling medical device cybersecurity? There was these really amazing ornate plans about we're going to do micro segmentation. It's going to be amazing. We're going to put all these medical devices. And it's just as soon as the pandemic started, I'll oh, just crumple that throat in the garbage. Like we're pulling old medical devices out of closets. We're pulling them out of old academic institutes. We're setting up clinics in parking lots and for good reasons. Right. But but I mean, that just all those network rules, all the segmentation just just gone. Um, right, so you ended up with this really big spaghetti monster of networking of medical devices now inside of hospitals because they just had to get stuff to work quickly. 
Um, and on the regulatory side, there was actually a relaxing of regulatory requirements for medical device manufacturers to put out updates to medical devices that enabled remote patient care. Um, so a medical device that previously a clinician had to walk into the room and do something to, if a manufacturer was able to put out a software update that removed the need for the clinician to walk into that room and instead maybe task it from a nurse's station, there was actually a relaxing of the regulatory rigor needed for the manufacturer to put out that update because they wanted those things to come out quickly. Um, so I support that they did that, but understanding that, that that also happened as a result. So some of the software updates that were coming out at the time to enable remote care um, to some of these medical devices did not go through the normal rigor process. And in, in, in some cases they did, right? Some manufacturers still did their normal business as usual, um, but some would have taken that route that was relaxed rigor on what was actually needed from a testing and verification perspective of those patches. Um, so you're just now starting to, in the healthcare space, I feel like you're just now starting to see these IT clinicians come out and up, up and able to breathe and actually say, okay, I need to clean out the spaghetti monster that I made. And so you're now starting to see that bandwidth come back where they're looking back at, okay, how do I resegment these networks? How do I get these legacy medical devices in a secure network versus just the, like, let's just put it all together and make it work. Um, so we're, I think we're starting to see now that wave of let's kind of clean up that technical debt that we acquired early on in the pandemic. And so we're starting to clean that up. I just want to get anyone in the audience to raise your hand. If you uh, saw a doctor or a nurse practitioner or some other provider uh, on your phone or on your laptop during this pandemic, raise your hand. All right, keep your hand up if you thought that was rad. <laughs> All right, keep your hand up if you think that that person was behind, like them connecting to the network and viewing your medical record or using the telehealth platform that they did uh, could, you know, uh, hold itself up to like the lowest of skid. Oh, there's like no one up there. <laughs> uh, exactly. To continue what, what Stephanie said was that, uh, like, I'm an ER doc. When the pandemic hit, I put my hacker brain to the side, and I thought, like, we're gonna be. I remember my, I remember my boss saying, pack a bag. You may that has to be. You have to live with two weeks of stuff. You may not see your family. You might have to live at the hospital. We don't know how bad this pandemic's gonna get. And so my hacker brain was like all this work that we had done to try to secure these devices and all the fear that I had about this had to go on the side and COVID took the front. And we were, that exactly was the paradigm we had, which was, you know, how can I treat patients at home w w when they have, uh, the uh, only thing I have is a phone for them to call me with. And so it, it was an explosion of access almost no regard for commensurate security. And I don't think that, I think that was the right call, right? We were worried about bodies in the streets at that point. I mean, luckily we, you know, not at least here in the United States, we saw that very often. Um, but I think what it showed to us also was that it is so fragile. It is amazing what actually supports healthcare and how fragile a technology that we are so dependent on is in use all the way around the world. And if it, it took this awful pandemic for the people paying attention to realize that, you know, it, it's a virus now, but our dependence and the potential for consequence to human life uh, could very easily be replicated with a, with a pretty large attack, right? a pretty large ransomware attack, for example. Bo, I want to ask you as somebody more on the policy side, um, I definitely echo what Quadi was saying, like when, when we were in the thick of it and we were intubating patients in the ICU and running low on ventilators, you know, we were looking for a machine that could deliver positive pressure to a patient with diseased lungs, and that's, that's the bare minimum. Um, there were so many inventive solutions, partly from the makers and the hacker space who were able to jerry rig things. Do, has your thinking at all changed with respect to the threat model? Because we had all of this exposure to medical devices and the security wasn't, wasn't really as much of an issue as we are now seeing with more infrastructure-based attacks. I mean, for the last five years, we've been worried about a discrete, individualized medical device, and now we're starting to appreciate the problem differently. Can you talk about your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, it's, that's a complex question. I'll give a, a slightly off-topic answer because something that Christian said really triggered me to think about um, the positive outcomes that we could see, and especially the in, in public policy, some of the positive outcomes. So for those people who raised your hands because you could see a doctor on your phone or on your laptop, 
That only happened because of a policy change where telehealth, telemedicine is now reimbursable by insurance. I think that's absolutely amazing. Like, why have we not had the ability for home health care? Why have we had to go into a doctor's office? Yeah, thank you. Why have we had to go into a doctor's office, take time out of our day or whatever? Why can't we just get on these phones? Um, the, the technology in the vaccines that most of us have now taken, uh, everybody in this room has been vaccinated. Not everybody has been vaccinated with the same technology, but like mRNA vaccines are absolutely astounding in what the capabilities are. And it, it kind of took a pandemic for us to unleash some of these things that we've been hyped hypothesizing about for a while and trying to do. Um, I remember I had a conversation with uh, a physiotherapist who, you know, physiotherapy is like very hands-on. You have to touch people, move their arms down and, and, and manipulate their body so that their body can recover in a way that, that helps them get by. Um, and they were doing remote physiotherapy sessions and the person's partner was actually the one who was doing the physical touch. Like, think about what that means in terms, of, in terms of a patient. Instead of having a stranger touch you or be there with you, it's your loved one, whether it's a, you know, a family member, a friend, or whatever. Um, I would like to, well, I wanna focus on the happy side of it and the, the fortunate side of it for a minute, because a lot of times we just look at the downsides. But um, I think there's a lot of amazing capabilities that can come out of it, and Jeff, to your question, you know, what is my, how does my threat model change? I'm seeing and trying to see, it takes conscious effort because we're wired differently than a lot of other people. I wanna see the, the benefits, the silver linings, um, and look at what can come out of this that we could then use to uh, create the next generation of patient care and the next generation of more convenient, um, more effective uh, medicine and, and health that we can deliver to people around the world. Okay, we're gonna ride that amazing, uplifting sentiment to the top of the roller coaster and we're gonna go right back down, okay? And I think that is, uh, we'll start off by saying, you know, the vaccine was uh, amazing and we have an expert on this panel to discuss that, but I mean, Gab, how close were we to like one ransomware attack to having six months delaying the vaccine? Like, that is terrifying shit. Think about how many people would die. And I'm kind of curious, because you have some insight. Yeah, definitely. It was bad. There were a lot of attempted attacks um, to either glean some vaccine information from what we had or just to kind of see what we were up to. And that would have upended everything. I mean, we were working really hard to kind of get everything out as fast as we could. The trials, some of them are running concurrently, phase two, three, four. Um, a lot of the sites performing the trials, I mean, I can tell you that the review of those was really scary and kind of quick. It was run through really quick. Um, and yeah, just... Anything that would have toppled that house of cards that was barely being held together um, would have been horrifying and it would have pretty much stopped everything completely in its tracks and taken down whatever work we had already had. And it doesn't sound, I guess, that bad since we're past that point, but there's no reason it couldn't happen again. So at the risk of asking you to toot your own horn, Bo, I mean, you and Josh, who's not here with us tonight, but you were hired at CISA specifically for the purpose of, you know, protecting this type of research infrastructure and vaccine delivery. What did the feds do right in this situation for once? I probably can answer that. He's gonna have to pass on that, sorry. Hard pass. <laughs> but we just wanna reiterate, you know, Gab is talking about so much of the research infrastructure, the collection of data, the clinical trials, the technology to develop the vaccine, to then manufacture the vaccine, if you really take a 40,000 foot view of that, you can know as a hacker how many very vulnerable links in that chain there were. And if only one broke, if one data center containing the critical stage, or sorry, um, phase two clinical data was, in, was uh, inop inoperable, inaccessible, that they'd have to redo all of that. And it could put us months behind. 
And it's not just the citizens of the United States that would have suffered, but that vaccine coming to market even days or weeks later would have resulted in thousands of deaths. It's amazing that we didn't think about this stuff ahead of time, or maybe we did, and I just wanted to give a shout out to the hacker community and say this. You know, I grew up a hacker, and I really think we are the ones that are screaming, this stuff is on fire. It's not just smoke, it's on fire, and we need to fix it. And we've been saying this for a long time, and it, I think, I hope after this, they're gonna take us a little bit more seriously. And, and really being able to fix this to some more appreciable amount so that next time something like this happens, it's not nearly as bad. So that's, that's really a give yourself a pat on the back, okay? All right, I'm gonna play a clip of Josh Corman given about a four minute, so he was supposed to be on this panel, he, he couldn't be on this panel, I'm gonna go over this podium, I'm gonna play a four minute clip, I want you guys to pay attention, and just to give you a tiny bit of a primer, this is a discussion about patients' lives. So I often get asked, show me the body count, right? I'm so, like, you talk to me in the, in, until you're blue in the face, Quaddy, about how bad this is in healthcare, but show me someone who's died. And, uh, you know, this is kind of the primer, you know, can, some would be injured by this. So, you guys go ahead. By the way, Bo, my question was a test and you passed it. <laughs> NCFs. Uh, these are the things that affect national security, national economic security, and national health and public safety. The one that's been in the red zone and the purple zone for the, most of the pandemic is called provide medical care. And this is what two of you do professionally every day. Um, we looked at severe strains throughout the pandemic, initially noticing um, a new problem because of the pandemic, which was cascading failures. So it used to be that if you had a ransom or an outage or some power problem, you would merely divert ambulances to the next nearby facility. And that's kind of predicated on the next nearby facility being able to receive anybody. So when everyone's at a saturated level or in the red zone themselves, a failure in any single hospitals tended to have cascading stressors or failovers uh, in nearby facilities. Uh, so, Christian, I heard in your amazing testimony to House Energy and Commerce, similar sentiments. So we started studying that as well. Then we started looking at something very poorly covered in the media, but the CDC tracks something really important every year, uh, every month, called excess deaths. And this is the difference between expected deaths and actual deaths uh, by condition, by month, by state, and at the national level. And when the U.S. hit that February milestone of 500,000 lost Americans to COVID, we also hit a different milestone of 150,000 lost Americans to non-COVID conditions that are otherwise treatable, very treatable. The number one aid demographic of that was 25 to 44 year olds. So young folks that could have been saved, but for excessive loads on our healthcare delivery across the country. So these are things like time sensitive things like heart attacks, strokes, um, cancer, uh, where time matters, minutes matter, hours matter, days or, or weeks. So uh, Christian and others on this panel in the past, we, we often cite the New England Journal of Medicine article that says 4.4 minutes during a marathon can be the difference between life and death and increased mortality rates for heart attacks. We know with strokes, the difference between life and death could be one, three or four hours. So what did four weeks of interruption in the state of Vermont do uh, with the UVM Medical Center and 118 facilities in upstate New York, Vermont, and New Hampshire. So again, where minutes matter, we know that delayed integrated patient care affects outcomes, including mortality rates. You know, we were deeply concerned about this and almost done some of these truth bombs. But when we looked with data scientists for the first time in this fusion center, we, we started to say, is there a relationship between capacity levels and mortality rates for excess deaths? And we're starting to share this with the public data, but without getting into the inflection points, we did see a strong and positive correlation between something like ICU bed count and excess mortality, uh, excess deaths two, four, and six weeks later. So we got a kind of a leading indicator that we could tell if a hospital, a region, a state was going to incur excess deaths if they were starting to reach too high of a capacity level. And then ask the really tough question that I think do no harm cares about, which is can cyber disruption uh, precipitate or accelerate or cause that harm to worsen? And of course we know fire is hot and water is wet. So of course 
any degraded and delayed patient care from any source can do this. But we did start asking the uncomfortable questions and look at the state's hardest hit by that concerted effort to disrupt healthcare during the month of uh, October and November. And uh, adjusting for all other, all other variables in a state like Vermont, um, it was very clear that electronically disrupted uh, hospitals achieved that excess death red zone much faster than their peer group. So again, if minutes and hours are the difference between life and death, and you're in a geography that can't get to the next nearby facility, um, we should stop asking, can cyber attacks lead to loss of life? We've answered the question. There's enough statistical evidence now to show this. Wow, that, that was, um, makes you feel happy inside, doesn't it? This is what we're talking about, is it's really important to protect patient health information. It's really, really important to realize that in medical conditions where minutes matter, the hospital infrastructure if under attack, and you could get worse care. I wanted to play that clip at the request of Josh's panel just to discuss briefly kind of your reflections of that because for the longest time we've gotten so much criticism and some of you out there in the crowd may have this, hey, show me the body count. You know, is this a turning point? Are we seeing more and more data? Can we now more reliably conclude that patient harm is real when a hospital gets ransomed? And what, what, the, what the hell do we do about it? I'm gonna just that, I'm gonna lay that out there. I mean, I think if you can listen to what Josh said and still think that there isn't a correlation immediately and that there isn't a body count, then you're not listening. Um, what can we do about it? That's really hard. If you work at a hospital or you have worked at a hospital, uh, then you already know that in some cases the choice between, you know, buying another blinky box or hiring a CISO, the trade-off for that is maybe you then can't buy um, an MRI machine or you can't hire another physician or nurse or other type of clinician. Those are really hard trade-offs to make. So uh, when, we, when we sometimes you know, sit back and for those, of, for those of you who haven't worked in healthcare and think, well, you know, just patch stuff or just uh, get somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, if you're a clinical access or a, a critical access facility that there's, you know, no other hospital for 100 miles, let's say, you got eight beds, you got five or six doctors, a handful of nurses, um, which, which nurse is going to be your IT person? probably none of them, but they're in the position where you can't really hire somebody in that local area because if you have IT talent, a lot of times you go to the bigger city because there's a salary there that you can't match locally. And a lot of these places are really struggling. If you look at uh, the 20, I think it came out in 2017, the HHS um, Healthcare Cybersecurity Task Force report, um, they looked at a lot of really important, profound truths and, and surfaced those and put them into a nice, uh, you know, page one graphic that are, here are the problems in healthcare. But they went beyond that and they said, here are some of the things we can do about it. Everything from public policy steps to uh, some things individuals could do, to things hospitals could do, you know, carrots and sticks, incentives and punishments. And I think there's, there's some good blueprints in there, including, you know, for instance, um, can we have uh, managed service providers that cater to the needs of these hospital workflows so that you know, if, you, uh, if you have an anti-spam filter and you get a bunch of emails from labs that might, uh, that might trip a threshold, you don't block the emails that are coming in from labs uh, where it's critical treatment information coming in, right? Um, how can we create some of the incentives that would allow for those managed service providers to do that so that you can scale up security protections or scale them down to the size that fits some of these small organizations that are really cash strapped? Um, how can you do several other things? So I'd, I'd encourage you to go take a look at that. Um, 
It's government reports, so a little bit dry, but but go check it out. And has anybody ever like called your hospital to like volunteer? Hey, do you guys need some help? Um, I, I'd like. I have a certain skill set and expertise. I'd like to see if I can help you. That might also be a step you could take, or uh, trade in um, temporarily trade in a high price job uh, for one that's maybe a little bit lower uh, lower salary, but in one of these healthcare areas where you can make a huge difference to somebody. I'm getting a thumbs up there. Uh, I I take it that at least one or two people in the audience have done something like that, so it is doable. Yeah, and so one of the things I also wanted to kind of shed light on the scale of the problem. Um, so giving people an idea of in just a what we think of as a pretty medium normal sized hospital, you may have around 6,000 unique makes and models of medical devices, um, digital medical devices um, on that hospital's network. So when you start to talk about the maintaining of cybersecurity of those medical devices, that is 6,000 unique makes and models that update patches in different ways um, that you have to keep track of if they're patched. Um, I can tell you from working with hospitals, the number that have a grasp on what medical devices are even on their network is just so tiny. Um, that is such a huge struggle in the space right now is hospitals, they, they don't know what medical devices they have. They don't, know, they don't know what's on their network from a medical device perspective. The ones that are more mature that I've worked with that have gone through that exercise, what they've found was the medical devices actually represented about 15 to 20 percent of the endpoints on that hospital's network. And so that's a really big percentage of endpoints that you think of all those other hospitals that don't have those maps that don't know what those 15 to 20 percent of those endpoints are on their hospital networks, um, that's pretty scary. And so the scale of the problem is huge. We don't know what's on the networks. There's such a unique amount of just makes and models that even if you do have a grasp on it, keeping those things up to date with the patches, inc just full-time job for dozens of people. And to Bo's point, they don't have full-time dozens of people just to run around and patch medical device cybersecurity. Um, and the other piece of it is just the legacy issue, right? Medical devices are actually designed really well. So for a medical device to perform its clinical function for 15, 20 years is not uncommon, right? But we all know there's just, there's literally no digital components we could have put in that that 15 or 20 years later is still secure. Um, and you can't keep patching it, right? At some point it can't run the latest and greatest of anything. Um, so you have a lot of these hospitals really struggling with this problem of they have these legacy medical devices that still perform their clinical function, but they represent a really high cybersecurity risk to their network. So how do they decide to let go of something that's still working, right? Medical devices are not cheap. Um, and when you think of, uh, an, again, a medium-sized hospital, right, one of the ones I worked with had about 1,200 um, infusion pumps, right? That's not even that big of a hospital, 1,200 infusion pumps. You go to replace that, that is millions of dollars um, to replace devices that are actually performing their clinical function just fine. Um, so where do you find the budget to do that when those devices are working, right? What is that bar of cybersecurity risk where you have to make that decision to end of life that medical device? Um, and a lot of hospitals are really struggling with that right now. Yeah, and I just want to take that problem, combine it with the problem that Josh mentioned on the video where we may have actual degradations of patient care here and, and turn the thinking a little bit from going from admiring the problem to understanding how this might be an opportunity to actually do something about it. And I think one of the things that is very exciting for me, um, bad jokes on my part aside, are having people who are knowledgeable about these issues from the hacker community in a position to where they can actually influence and direct policy at a number of really awesome agencies that are doing some some incredible work. And um, Christian's not going to say this, so I will, but he's doing an operational role. He's a medical director of security at a hospital. So there are hospitals who don't look at this as something that they don't want to address, but actively invite and engage people to help them solve it. I mean, there may be a situation in the future, and we can talk about the potential policy aspects here where, you know, there's a recovery and a stimulus, and maybe this is something that we should address and put resources towards to help these hospitals that don't have them. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I commonly think about this as a problem analogous to clinical medical disease, right? It's much easier to prevent a problem or to manage it chronically before it becomes an acute issue uh, spiraling out of control. And so I think figuring out ways for um, us to turn towards those types of solutions is really interesting in this particular moment. All right, we're going to play a little game. All right, raise your hand if you think that if a hospital loses your medical records, they should be fined a, a lot of money. That's okay. All right, keep... All right, um, keep your hands up 
if you think that that's going to make health care cheaper for you. <laughs> All right, keep your hand up if you think health care is cheap. Tell me if you think it's going to get cheaper in the next 20 years. We have a, oh, I hope so. I really hope so. <laughs> I, and maybe so. You should, I need to talk to you because you, you have the solution and I, I don't know what to do. So we get these hospitals, we talked about how hard the problem is, how they don't have the people to help them, how they're up to their necks in vulnerable legacy medical devices and infrastructure that's very fragile. Uh, they get owned and they have a big breach and they have to pay millions of dollars in fines. And then um, it's going to probably increase health care costs across. And, you know, Bo talked about the trade-offs that hospitals have to make if they pay a big fine, how much money are they going to have left over to, to fix the freaking volms that got owned to start, right? It's a really hard problem, but we have to hold people accountable and organizations accountable for this. And we're in a real hard spot. You know, there are cyber, I'm sorry, I'll drink a whole case of Red Bull later. I'm freaking sorry about this, all right? But there are cyber haves and have-nots in healthcare. There are hospitals that have marble floors and palm trees in the waiting room, right? Those exist, and they're doing a lot better. And then there are rural hospitals and critical access hospitals that bleed millions of dollars every year and are the only ones taking care of patients for 500 miles. And if that hospital didn't exist, people would die. They're the ones with shared credentials, still running Windows 7. They're the ones that can't afford new infusion pumps, and we want to find them a lot. And so I'm not saying let's pity these hospitals, but we got to figure out, well, how do we fix this problem? And I want to just have a hand up. Would you as a taxpayer be willing to pay to have health care more secure? Raise your hand. Would you be willing to spend taxpayer? Oh, my. Take don't take a picture because it's against the rules. But this is, this is the sentiment, right? It, it's a shared thing. The pandemic has reminded us that we all share this ecosystem of healthcare. It's really fragile and it's unacceptable that it maintains in this state. And what we really need to do is raise the entire ecosystem's uh, security resilience. I'm going to just quickly say, uh, I worked in the ER on a Monday. And if you work in the ER, you know that Monday is the worst day to work. They're always the busiest. I was on a Monday and the waiting room was blowing up. Wait times were skyrocketing. Patients were staying in the hospital for two or three days, in the emergency department sometimes, two or three days waiting for beds upstairs. What happened? It wasn't even us that got hit with ransomware. It was a hospital system in the same town as us, right? It's an ecosystem of care and that if we don't build up the resilience of the entire ecosystem, guess what's going to happen to the ambulance transport time if you have a stroke or a heart attack and you have to go and bypass those five other hospitals that are on diversion because they got hit with ransomware? Guess what? Your time's going to be longer. And that's not going to do well for your heart or for your brain. Maybe the difference between whether or not you walk or talk or eat or live or need to have a pacemaker implanted in your body. Sorry for the rant. I wanted to op oh anyway, reflections of that before I move on to a less depressing topic? No. No. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're familiar with software bill materials. Anyone? All right, rad. I'm going to quit talking because there's this thought about software bill materials as a potential mechanism to reduce um, vulnerabilities or at least identify vulnerabilities and patch them sooner. I'm going to open it up to the panel here. Briefly talk about SBOM and then as well as whether or not it's going to fix all these problems, right? Is this the magic secret sauce? Yeah, so I'll start this. Um, so for those who, you know, said you're familiar with the SBOM, um, one of the things everyone in the room might not realize is that I actually credit sort of the healthcare and medical device space with being one of the first industries to actually really rally around this concept. So the NTIA working group that was really building the foundation of what is now becoming a NIST standard based on the NTIA working group um, work, that was actually very heavily run by the healthcare industry. And so the healthcare industry has had several years of working on SBOMs. If you look at that draft pre-market guidance that I mentioned that the FDA put out about two years ago, you'll actually see that that was one of the requirements inside it. They called it a C-bomb at the time. They're updating it to be called an SBOM to align with industry terminology. Um, but 
this whole concept of nest bomb is really polarizing. It's very interesting to talk to people who are just immediately against this, thinking like, oh my God, we're just giving a roadmap to all the attackers. And I'm one of the people on the side of the fence that actually says this is actually a really good thing, right? The attackers are going to figure out the roadmap. They're going to figure out what's in your device anyway. Instead, let's enable the good guys to actually have that list of ingredients that's inside of our devices. Um, and so for anyone following on the, following on the policy side, um, earlier in May, there was an executive order that came out here in the United States around sort of this supply chain transparency and one of the things hidden inside of that was around SBOM. Um, and so that's why you start to see that initial NTIA working group around the SBOM is actually now getting translated into a NIST standard. And so so much more of a spotlight has been brought onto this topic of an SBOM and um, since that May executive order. But the healthcare space has actually been really working on this um, for a number of years. And some of the initial like formats around cycle MDX, I'm trying to think of the other two. I'm totally blanking on the other two formats, but a lot of the work around getting SBOM to actually be operationalized is getting around consistent formatting and consistent nomenclature. And so the healthcare space has been working on that for several years, trying to actually figure out, you know, how do we, one, generate SBOMs um, in a consistent manner? And then how do you get use out of them, right? So we've had a lot of hospitals who are actually trying to use SBOMs um, and there's struggle on both sides of it. And so I would encourage anyone who's interested, the NTIA working group actually put out a report around how we tried to use SBOMs in the medical device space, how hospitals tried to leverage them and a lot of the struggles um, basically that are, are, are still in the works of trying to tackle, like how do we make this really impactful in the healthcare space? Um, and to Bo's point earlier, anyone in this, in this audience who is interested in that topic, absolutely get involved. Those working groups are open. You can reach out and join any of them. Um, we absolutely need as many security people as we can working on these topics. Any, any of the guidance around cybersecurity for medical devices, I would encourage anyone in this audience to join them. Um, we need those guidances, I will say. I have sat on a number of those working groups around any kind of regulation, guidance document, technical frameworks that come out for the medical device security space. Um, and they're so influential in the space, but I can tell you a lot of the working groups really lack subject matter expertise. There's a lot of people who write standards um, as their day job. And I love them, gotta have people who love writing standards. Um, but what we're lacking in a lot of those working groups is the security expertise. Um, and it's not sexy work. You will sit on phone calls where you listen to people argue about where commas should be for literal hours. Not joking. Um, and it is incredibly painful, but at the end of the day, when those regulations come out, they need cybersecurity expertise to make sure that those are actually impactful. So same things with those working groups, that NTIA, we need more security people. Um, so anyone in this audience, if you want to make an impact, one of the biggest ways you can do it, if you're not willing to sort of change jobs and change your salary, um, join those working groups. Be a subject matter expertise on any med device security working group. If you're not sure which ones to join, absolutely reach out to me. I can send you a list of stuff, but uh, please be on those working groups and lend your security voice. Um, for those who aren't familiar with, with SBOM, software bill of materials, the idea is gross oversimplification, but it's like an ingredients list on your food, right? What's, what's in the thing that you're using? Um, and Dr. Marie Mo, who is herself a pacemaker patient, uh, sometimes says that um, she, she can know the ingredients that go into the candy bar she's eating, but she can't know the ingredients that go into the pacemaker that keep her alive. And in a, another very oversimplified example, um, if you look at two extremes, and you know, software bill of materials is not either of these extremes, but two extremes, one where manufacturers have no idea what goes into the products that they make and sell you, and one where they have full visibility into the, what goes into the products that they make and sell you, which one would you rather be at? Anybody, anybody want manufacturers to not have no idea? Raise your hand. Christian does. He's, he's in that camp. That's cool. Um, but uh, in some of the, the last few years when uh, hospitals have started asking medical device makers to provide a software bill of materials, it caused those medical device makers to have to figure out what's actually in their software, what's in their hardware. And they said when they looked into it, it scared the hell out of them. And they issued updates, not because there was a new vulnerability announced, but because they found out that there were very old vulnerabilities that were causing undue risk. So the act of asking to reveal what's in your software, what's in your hardware, 
can have a catalytic reaction, even if, uh, to your point, even if the, the hospitals themselves don't know how to use it, the act of asking can create that. And in financial services organizations, um, they've been doing this for a while. One of the people who uh, participated in some of the NTIA conversations uh, said that uh, they were at a, a large bank and they asked for a software bill of materials. And if the manufacturer of that software couldn't tell them what's in their software, then they asked them for a 20% discount because they knew that they were going to have to layer on extra security on top of whatever they bought because they couldn't account for what was actually there. So there's many, many uses for a software bill of materials, whether you keep that internal to the organization that's developing the software or whether that's something that's requested and passed on uh, through, through the supply chain. Just to add on to that a little bit, I mean, as someone who's sat on a pharmacological review board as well as um, a recombinant DNA review board, we analyze every single ingredient that goes into every single pharmaceutical that is out there. It's tested over and over again. We know exactly where it came from, um, you know, what modifications it has, things like that. Why wouldn't we want to know what configurable pieces go into medical devices? All right, so if you've ever been to Do No Harm before, you kind of know that we do this for a little bit. Uh, we're going to take a couple audience questions for the full panel, and then what we're going to do is we're going to break up, and each one of the panelists is going to go into a corner or so. You can congregate around them. Uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. I have one last question for the uh, panel before we take open Q&A, and that's going to be, I'll, I'll first say, who here is invigorated, or sorry, who here is depressed after watching this talk? Or, yeah, raise your hand. It's okay. Who here? Uh, you guys are already depressed, so you couldn't get any more depressed. Okay. Well, if you need antidepressants, Jeffrey at the end can write you a prescription for some. They take a while to kick in, so we encourage you to start now. Um, how many of you are not depressed, but maybe like invigorated? to like try to go and, and try to help this problem or try to contribute to make things better. Oh, that's amazing. That's my last question for the panel. Each of us could take an opportunity to say is the hackers in the audience, what can they do individually besides what we already talked about, you know, take a pay cut and go work for a hospital. Anything else that you in the audience could do to make this better, set, you know, sit on a standards, et cetera. But anything else to take away before we open up the Q&A? I'll say talk to your own doctors and nurses and people who you interact with as a patient and make sure that they're up to speed on some of these issues. They don't have to be experts, but make sure that they are aware of the fact that this is becoming something they should pay attention to. Yeah, and then so I already mentioned uh, the working groups, so absolutely the working groups. Um, but beyond that, if you work at a vendor that is in the software security solution space, right, so maybe you guys make some widget that is supposed to help with cybersecurity. Um, Think about how that widget may help the healthcare space. There's a lot of general purpose sort of security widgets out there. They, they just don't work in the healthcare space. Um, either the medical devices are too resource limited, they have interesting operating systems, they cause too much of a delay on the system for things that have real-time signal processing. There's a lot of general purpose security widgets out there that literally just do not work in the medical device security space. Um, so they're also very limited in some of the solutions that they can just generally adopt. So if you worked at one of these tool vendors, maybe bring up the fact that like, hey, what do we do about the medical device space? Is there something we could pivot our software product to do? Um, and then, of course, obviously, just go work for a medical device manufacturer or a healthcare organization. I don't know a single one that does not have open job recs right now for security people. I mean, it's kind of a conglomeration of the previous ones, but ask a lot of questions. Um, you know, question everything. Do your research. Visit the villages that are, you know, messing around with your medical devices and your infrastructure and just... Um, be that kind of force that's can continue to be an advocate for this kind of thing. Yeah, um, there's a lot of good things that have already been said. I'll say something that's, that's slightly uh, different, which is uh, states actually hold a lot of power over healthcare. Um, states, in a lot of cases, are regulator of hospitals and others. So, uh, a lot of time, there's a, a big focus on federal. Um, legislature on federal public policy, but states also do a lot of public policy, and a lot of times they don't get the help and support from uh, the the organizations that tend to frequent D.C. So wherever you live, you have a 
state government unless you live outside of the United States, in which case you have another type of local government. And oftentimes, you know, you can just call up whoever your local representative is and say, hey, I have a certain skill set. I'd like to offer it to you. Do you have anything that's going on? Or, you know, ask them for a briefing. You'll get 15 minutes and you can go talk about healthcare security and some of the consequences and some of the other things. And just having those conversations sometimes will lead to um, them taking some action. Maybe it's writing a letter. Something as simple as writing a letter, even from a state legislator, can make a big difference in nudging hospital administrators or medical device makers or doctor boards or others into a, a situation where they actually consider security as a part of whatever they're working on, whatever they're doing. Awesome, I just got one thing to say. I think one of the most important things that happened in this space in the last you know, 10, 11 years was that hackers out there went out and got medical devices and started poking at them and started finding what was wrong with them and brought that to our attention, whether or not it be Kevin Foo's group talking about pacemaker AICDs or Barnaby Jack before he died uh, talking about that or Jay Radcliffe's infusion pump or Dr. Marie Mo, you know, reverse engineering some crypto on her own pacemaker. These are the types of things that hackers do really well and we need more of that. We need more of you out there doing some device research. It's Believe it or not, pretty easy to get a medical device, depending on the medical device. You'd be kind of shocked somehow how, how easy it is. Poke, prod, bring your research to a place like DEF CON. Teach others around you, because that action, those hackers that went and did that research and brought it to everyone's attention, they really freaking moved mountains, I'll tell you, right? The FDA did great things in response to the research, had their backs as security researchers, and as long as you do it in a safe and responsible way, using things like coordinated vulnerability disclosure, you know, being responsible about that, knowing that these vulnerabilities can really impact human life, doing that type of research, and hacking on things like we do can really make a big difference. And so I would encourage you out there to do it and to do it right and to be responsible with it, but that can help us really change a lot of minds. Oh yeah. So to add one thing to that, um, I mentioned I used to work at the FDA. I worked there for a year uh, on a one-year uh, program. Um, they really want to hear from you. In 2012, 2013, 2010, when some of the initial hackers were doing their research on medical devices, um, security wasn't as prominent on their radar. Today, they're all bought in. Um, I mean, come on, they, they hired me um, to come in and help them. They uh, actively recruit, they're not here this year, of course, uh, but um, in the past several years, they've been out at the biohacking village going to talk to, to hackers, going to talk to medical device makers, making sure that medical device makers know that uh, they expect a certain level. And in fact, one of the things that we pioneered was a, a website called WeHard Hackers, uh, wehardhackers.org, where the FDA, um, the, the um, director of the FDA came out and said, we want more medical device makers to put their devices in the hands of hackers so that they can uh, find the bugs before they be become harmful. And so if you're researching medical devices, uh, if you have done your diligence to report to a, a medical device maker, the next step should not be public disclosure. It should be coordination, if not with the medical device maker, with the FDA. They want to hear from you. And they can pull levers that you can't. They have an amazing uh, suite of capabilities that they can use to figure out what the right thing is, not for the medical device maker, not for uh, your ability to you know, drop O'Day at, at Black Hat, but for patients. And that's what this is really about. It's about patients, it's about healthcare, it's about those vulnerable people who really need this. So I just wanted to add that. Awesome, all right, well we're gonna take some questions for the full panel. Uh, I'm gonna ask you the following. If you could come up a little bit closer to the stage, please do not spew COVID on anybody. Uh, ask a question, I'll repeat it. There might be some questions that are off limits, but I don't really think that's probably gonna be a problem here. And then if you wanna save your question to an individual panel member, after we take a few questions, we're gonna break up. And then again, I'm gonna remind everybody, respect people's uh, COVID precautions, don't get too close, wear your mask, especially with our panelists as they're around and the people around you, because we're a community of hackers, we're a family. Last thing we want to do is hurt each other, okay? Uh, any questions?
Okay. Yeah, so the question was, uh, how do you get software and I'm assuming hardware vendors who come sell a product and leave and never give su support or uh, how, do you f how do you address that issue because it's a really huge one? Does that, that make sense that I encapsulate yeah, I, that well? I think it was yeah, just, acquisition. Yeah. Co uh, medical device makers that get sold to other medical device makers too, right? I've seen a lot of like Windows XP machines and stuff like that and run into like basically companies that they create this great platform program that looks great, they sell it off and they sell it off for like 10 years but then yeah. you just never get support from it. So there's no patches, there's no updates and this company is basically like hospitals and something that are stuck using this platform that doesn't work, is out of date, has vulnerabilities and the company that sold it to doesn't care anymore because they already made their money. So how to deal with shitty vendors. Yeah, so I guess I'll rephrase it not from shitty, but vendors who are not very clear about communicating end of support. Um, so one of the things that several manufacturers are trying to do is make it very clear, kind of like Windows, right? When, when, when Microsoft releases Windows, they tell you the second that comes out when you're going to stop getting support for that operating system so you can make a decision on what you're going to do with that operating system because you know when support's going to end. Manufacturers are still very early in that maturity of announcing how long are you going to support this medical device that I'm selling to you. So you do have instances of manufacturers continuing to sell medical devices and you just, you literally have no idea when they're going to end support or end of life that from a um, security update perspective. So there are some manufacturers who are working on this concept of this end of support, end of cybersecurity support, that when you buy that device you know, but I would say right now that's still in its kind of infancy of its maturity cycle. So it is, the big ones are aware that that is an issue, they have not solved it yet. Um, um, you mentioned it earlier, the FDA's post-market guidance. Uh, the FDA actually set up something new with medical devices so that security issues can trigger recalls. Um, at the same time, they gave uh, a carrot to manufacturers. They said if you, if you meet certain thresholds, you don't have to do a recall. A recall in, in healthcare is a big deal. Bad news. Um, so if you know about security vulnerabilities in a product, you can report that to the medical device maker. Again, if they don't do anything about it, you can talk to the FDA. Uh, as long as those devices are out there, that manufacturer has a responsibility to monitor safety, potential safety issues. And that's what cybersecurity issues are, according to the FDA. So there's a hook there that you can use to get at least awareness and attention. And when um, one of the researchers, Billy Rios, looked into security of some infusion pumps, um, even though the manufacturer no longer sold the pumps, they were required to issue an update or try and pull them off the market. And so that's what they ended up doing. And that manufacturer actually changed a lot of what they did. Um, and they became, I think it was them, that they became the first manufacturer that went through um, the UL certification for security. Uh, they've been at uh, the DEF CON biohacking village device lab every year that we've had it. So the act of, of causing them to have to pay attention to security changed a lot of the way that they did business. So I would say use those mechanisms that already exist um, to go through those types of channels that they pay attention to already. Thank you for the excellent question. Um, th if I could kind of distill the question down, at the heart of it is, do we have data to be able to measure, or do we have data to compare 
certain interventions, right? Potentially between uh, countries, for example, have different types of healthcare systems. Do we have uh, very basic measurements of whether or not things work and whether or not outcomes are better if they're a more secure health environment, for example? Okay, I'm gonna take the stab at this because this is a little bit of a passion of mine. Um, it is amazing to me how little data we have. Right? When you drive a car or when you, use, uh, when you go and um, do something of importance, when they make a product, they collect a lot of data. And they make decisions off that data because it matters. In, in healthcare cybersecurity, again, I swear I'll drink a whole case of Red Bull for you guys. So I'll give myself heart palpitations. We have no data. I would love to be able to do a study that compares, you know, take country A that has a nationalized health system and is quite secure, for example, comparatively to a lot of hospitals that are in the United States. And let's take a measurement of their heart attack victims and say who has better outcomes or who's more resilient to ransomware or what type of interventions in a hospital uh, or mitigation, security control mitigations in a hospital actually result in less ransomware attacks. We don't have any of that data. We don't have the sophistication to even begin to ask those questions. We have to build the whole infrastructure. We have to get people to believe this is an actual issue. We have to put in place the sensors and epidemiology to collect that data, and then analyze that data. We gotta train researchers to do this. And what I'm trying to say is unfortunately, it's a dismal thing to even think about. All we have right now are anecdotes. We don't even have evidence, we have stories. And Jeff mentioned, or not Jeff, Josh mentioned on the video that we are now starting to collect that data in some cases and publish it. I do think in a silver line to this, right now we don't have the data. I think 2021, 2022 is gonna be a banner year for this. I think we're gonna finally get some published peer reviewed data out there that says that ransomware attacks hurt people. Not just their protected health information, but their actual lives. And that I hope is a catalyst for positive change moving forward. And I hope it encourages a lot of other people to wanna study this more rigorously because that's what we're gonna need if we're really gonna you know, move the needle on this. Sorry, anyone else? I'll, I'll build a little bit on that. Um, while we don't have data, we do have some empirical evidence. Uh, one of the things that um, several of us do is we run an event called the CyberMed Summit. And the CyberMed Summit, one of the, the really cool parts of it, and one of the things that I think has been eye-opening for a lot of people, is uh, these clinical simulations. So just like pilots go into a flight simulator, so the first time they land in 30 knot crosswinds and fog is not the first time they've ever experienced that. They experience it in a controlled setting. Doctors do the same thing. And what these two geniuses on the end did is they created clinical simulations that replicate what would happen if there's a security issue with a medical device, whether it's you know, ransomware of a lab system, uh, whether it's a pacemaker that's been hacked, whether it's an insulin pump that's uh, been hacked. Um, and based on the evidence that you can gather from how doctors actually go through in this uh, simulated environment, in this controlled environment, um, we actually know a lot about what, uh, what would happen and not just what would happen with the patient, but what happens next. Um, do the doctors say, I think that device got hacked, or do they just uh, send it down to Biomed to see if it can be updated um, or you know, reset? Uh, do they blame the clinicians who are in the room with them for you know, setting the wrong drip rate on the IV, or do they say, I want this investigated and we need to do a root cause analysis on what caused this? And I think what we found is that um, the awareness among physicians is not necessarily there. Uh, the awareness among um, health centers is not necessarily there. Even when it is there, you may not have the data on the device. You don't, may not have logs. So you may not be able to tell what happened. Um, even if you have the data, the biomed people might not be able to read it because it might be in a format they don't understand or in a way that they can't get it off. If they want to send it to the manufacturer, the first thing the manufacturer does is says, wipe all the data, we don't want any patient data on it. So, uh, you know, it's hard to get the evidence, but I think Christian's right. I think that 2021 is gonna be a year where we see a drive towards 
um, acquiring, uh, reviewing, analyzing, publishing data, statistical information, and the types of things that we need to change doctors' minds, because they are scientifically driven. And if it's not in a peer-reviewed journal, um, it's for them just anecdotes. Uh, that's great because they build off education, they build off knowledge over years to do something that is statistically relevant, but it also slows down our ability to change healthcare. Yeah, can I, like, I'll chime in on this one. So one, I will actually say... Can you repeat the question? So oh, yeah, sorry. 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 So his, he actually works at a hospital, and so they had an incident where a machine actually did get, like, configure, which is, you know, we should be resilient to that at this point. Um, and, yeah, of course, their solution was, we'll take it offline, turn it off. Like, well, you can't. A PAC system serves a very critical role inside of a hospital system. It, it has to literally be on the network or it serves no purpose. Um, and so his question was like, how do we fix this, right? So one of the most powerful things I've seen is the hospitals actually literally using cybersecurity in a purchase decision and literally saying no when it doesn't meet their cybersecurity bar. Um, and so, you know, the FDA and the regulatory bodies, you know, they're raising the bar, but at the end of the day, if a manufacturer can't sell to you as a hospital, that keeps them up at night. Um, and, but I also will say a, a, a lot of manufacturers are doing better. Um, but the, the biggest lever you can pull as a hospital is, is at purchase time, make sure cybersecurity is part of that purchase decision, and if it doesn't meet your cybersecurity bar, then you have to be willing to not buy that device. Well, and, and it's hard, like what I'm saying, like it sounds easy in principle, it's not, right? And at the end of the day, if the device provides a clinical function that is better than all of the competitors and its security is worse, at the end of the day, you know what, patients come first and you have to still buy that device. Um, but there's a lot of competitive devices out there, so if there's another device that serves the same clinical function with like similar efficacy, buy the one with better security. I, I take it you guys don't, guys and gals don't really like vendors. Is that, is that a common thing? What? Oh. <laughs> but see, this is how you have to help vendors go work, like go work with them, right? So I've consulted with them for years. Like they actually want to do the right thing. They do not have the resources to do the right thing. All right, we're gonna go ahead and say, I'm sorry, please we're, hang out here. We're gonna get you the right questions, the right people, but I think it's important for us to break up. It wouldn't be a do no harm if you couldn't come face to face with a panelist and ask like hard questions. So, all right. Um, Again, to reiterate, find whatever speaker on the panelist you want in a corner, ask them a question, mass and distance, and move around. If you see someone that's particularly swamped, maybe go to the other and then come back. It's gonna be a little bit of a give and take, all right? Thank you again, DEF CON, for this. Please give yourself Big round a round of applause. applause. All right, come talk to us. Yeah, and I was just going to apologize. I actually have to run, but um, find me. If you have questions, I love talking about this topic. Find me on LinkedIn, Stephanie Domas. You can find my name in the program. But uh, if you have questions for me, I would love to answer them, but uh, reach out to me online. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>